please, Professor Amir, it's your stage now. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm glad to, to share the same views with Colin that uh, Harry is not going really to retire. So, so is my title of the first page. You see, I said marking Zudo retirement of Harry rather than retirement. Okay, um, I have promised my friends uh, and colleagues that this is going to be a somehow entertaining uh, uh, talk. Uh, but in the same time, I see that uh, some gurus of steel metallurgy are present and this talk. So what happened is that during this presentation, I will be switching between some technical and non-technical sort of uh, uh, pages and references to keep both uh, group of the audience happy. And this talk uh, comes in basically three parts. The main part is about my recent work on joining steel aluminium, which was the part of the project to help with the COVID-19 pandemic. And then I will move on my, with uh, my, the work which I did when I was in Harry's group and the development of the new welding alloys and, and so on. And finally, closing remarks and some memorable moments which we had with Harry. Okay, I am assuming everything is okay and you see the screen because I can only see my own screen. Um, could you please confirm you see the screen? Yes, we do. We see okay, your excellent. screen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry, I'm just double checking because I don't see anything else. Okay, uh, at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, as you know, the demand for uh, production of the vaccine went quite uh, high. And that was not only the vaccine itself, uh, which demand went up, but the equipment, including the esterilization system, normally by x-ray systems is also increased. So you can imagine that suddenly the companies, they have to produce hundreds of millions of wires and the old equipments which makes those wires, makes those equipments, making the packaging system all of them, they need some sort of uh, sterilization before being used and before to carry the vaccine. So it's quite understandable that there was a huge increase in the demand for that component. This picture the, on the top left, you see an example of the uh, high intensity or high energy X-ray tube, not necessarily the one which was related to this project, but just, just give you some idea of what kind of component we are talking about. Okay, joining steel to aluminum, why do we need? These are three examples of niche examples of why we need to join steel to aluminum. Uh, in the center is the component of interest, the X-ray tube. Again, not the one which I was working, but is a very good example. As you see, it is a pretty complex component. It works in a very high vacuum and it requires joining the similar material because the flanges where the inlet and outlets are connected, they have to be made from stainless steel. And that requires very hermetic and strong bonds between the casing, which is normally aluminum. On the left-hand side is another example. It's a simulator for 3D printing in space. The cage or the box is made of aluminum, but again, the connections and the, and the flanges, they have to be made from stainless steel and same with the infrared telescope. As you see that it's made of mostly aluminum with some other uh, steel components attached to it. In these sort of cases, mechanical bonding or bolting is out of question, it doesn't work, which I will explain a bit later. Okay, now a bit technical. Fusion welding of aluminum to steel is almost impossible. And the reason you can see this in phase diagram. As you see, I call it the, from the bonding point of view, it's a pretty messy phase diagram. And that is basically the moment you start to do to melt aluminum, it will form lots of uh, huge amount of intermetallic, brittle intermetallics, which, uh, which basically you ended up with a very glossy and brittle uh, joint, which is good for nothing. The current technology to make those particular bimetal steel aluminum flanges is by explosive welding. 
explosive welding has been used so far. It, it generates very high strength joints, that's for sure. But there is a problem that the lead time, if you want to order it, it needs a few months to advance ordering. Uh, supply is limited. There are only few manufacturers in the world that they can supply explosive slabs of the aluminum steel. It is a costly process and high possibility of vacuum leak because explosive welding generates mechanical joints rather than metallurgical bonding. So if the component has very thin sections, it is quite likely that at high vacuum, you get some kind of leaking. So how do they get away with it? It's simple. They make lots of component and the scrap rate is very high because these parts and basically components are quite expensive. Somehow they can afford scrapping them basically. Whatever it built to the last stage, tested in the vacuum. If it doesn't pass the test, it has to be scrapped. Okay, alternative solution would be diffusion bonding, which is my specialty. I did my PhD under Dr. Wallach's supervision on diffusion bonding aluminum. I admit that it is the least popular, maybe most unpopular joining method. And the reason is that, first of all, initial investment and running costs are pretty much eye watering, very, very expensive. Bonding times are not like a second or even minutes, normally within hours. It requires high surface finish and control atmosphere. That's why if you come to my lab in Open University, you see that I am always dusting and cleaning the surfaces and asking people not to leave the doors open. And finally, repeatability is a, is a concerning issue in most cases. So if it is so, why do we do diffusion bonding anyway? The answer is in this picture. As you see, you get near perfect or almost perfect joint. This is the welded or diffusion bonded stainless steel. It's hardly, it's hardly we can recognize the, where the joint was. On the right hand side, uh, I use the same technique to make this uh, laminated object manufacturing. It made up many, many layers of stainless steel to make some kind of reformer or the heat exchanger. As you see that uh, despite all those disadvantages, diffusion bonding has its own niche sort of application or uh, properties. In, in short, diffusion bonding, uh, these are the examples when you, when you do diffusion bonding. On the left-hand side are the unweldable sort of combination of dissimilar material that diffusion bonding becomes the only or maybe one or two options left for joining these materials. In the middle top, uh, there are weldable materials, but um, we cannot use any brazing or any interlayer because we need pure joint, for example, in medical devices. And the middle bottom is obvious is joining metals to ceramic by welding is not feasible. And on the right hand side are the weldable materials. But when you're looking for a very high um, precision, then diffusion bonding becomes the only option. I have bonded the rotor for satellite with quarter a million RPM. And the only way was diffusion bonding because of the precision needed. OK. And it was August 2020, US companies approached me and Open University asking whether I can manufacture those flanges for the vacuum for the x-ray tubes using a diffusion bonding because they were not uh, happy with the outcome of the explosive welding and also the number of the demand for the component were rocketing. Uh, one of the memorable pictures on the top left, you see that my car is parked in an empty car park, which before COVID it was impossible to find the parking space. Open University kindly allowed me to go back to my lab with also some friends and colleagues from the workshops and the engineering and other assistants. We started working around the clock on developing new technology, not only new technology, but also component level sort of uh, production. And in the middle, you can see me that I am dipping the manufactured basically 
bimetal steel aluminum in the liquid nitrogen part of the testing. And also, I think I traveled around 5,000 miles last year with Open University and other companies where I was accessing the large component which I needed for my experiments. Okay, I cannot go to the too much detail of how I bond aluminum to steel, and, but I can give you insight to the, to the process which was developed. Okay, if you're bonding A to B, and A to B are soluble in each other, diffusion bonding is very easy. If they make, they basically form intermetallics, then there is one option. The option is that to control the time and temperature in such a way that you get a thin, uniform, continuous intermetallic at the joint. If intermetallics are not bad, if they are thin and continuous, but with aluminum and steel is a nightmare. I have chosen these three micrographs to, to show you why it is. If you try to join them at 505, just above 500, you get no bonding. If you increase it by five degrees, I'll be looking at the left-hand side micrograph, 510 degrees, you see that you get those bubbling effect. You see that some parts, the intermetallic is forming and penetrating into the aluminum and some other parts, nothing happened. Compared to the micrograph in the middle is even worse. The same temperature, if I heat it a bit slowly, I get again intermetallic a bit more semi-continuous. And if you keep the same bond at 450 degrees C for one hour, you will get a very thick intermetallic. So that is why I use the terminology of avalanche style formation of intermetallic. So when you have avalanche style, you will not be get away with just adjusting the temperature because even five degrees or two, three degrees makes all the difference from not having a bond, having a brittle bond or having very thick and very brittle bond. And that is where the problem is. So the solution is to have an interlayer, but the interlayer not only should have a good bonding to aluminum and steel, it should also act as a diffusion barrier. This is a bit of contradictory because diffusion bonding relies on diffusion of the atoms. But in this case, our interlayer will also should act as a, as a diffusion barrier. Basically the marriage between aluminum and iron is made in hell. The interlayer should not allow these two elements to reach each other across the joint interval. Okay, timelines and developments. Uh, August to December last year, we developed a suitable interlayer which had good bonding and also act as a diffusion barrier. We did opt I did optimization and the first set of prototype was sent to US for their initial testing. Uh, early this year, we upscaling using larger equipment and the further optimization and finally fabrication of the full size component. Here we are. I mean, these uh, tensile tests it speaks for itself, including the picture on the right hand side. You see that the bond strength exceeded the UTS of the aluminium. And with all respect uh, to the academic research, uh, I maybe a little bit of joke, but maybe also some reality in it is that in academic world, uh, one good sample you can publish and you can become famous in production, research and development, what one bad sample, that's it, it perish. Maybe Colin is also going to his company, he agrees on that matter with me. So one of the rings, you can see that how many tensile tests we have to do on the, on the sample to make sure the process is repeatable. My colleague says we did more than 250 tensile tests. And I don't remember how many hours of SEM, metallography, and it's the really huge work you know, carried out within, within the first six months. Okay, on the left-hand side is not the exactly component which I, we use for the sterilization, but it's a component very similar in terms of um, concept to uh, what I'm going to try to explain. As you see, the aluminum casing has got lots of uh, steel flanges welded to it. So in order to satisfy the US standards, the bond strength should be as high as, higher as aluminum UTS. Basically no failure from the bond. 
it has to be hermetic, it says ultra high vacuum. And also it should withstand basically the huge thermal shocks from minus 50, 150 to 400 degrees C. And the reason for 400 degrees C is that because these components will eventually be welded back to the casing. So the growth of the intermetallic during the welding process will be a killing element. So, and finally, repeatability in the production stage. That's, that's also very difficult to achieve anyway. So this is, this is the, I tried to get the admin permission to show you the whole component, but this, this is as far as I, I manage. You can see the component, which is literally made in the UK at Open University. And this is the flange, which is sitting on, on a surface made of steel. And, and you see that there are lots of holes drilled into it and the two outlets inlets welded on the system. And you can imagine that some of the sections are very, very small. It is already heated up to 400 degrees. It should operate in very low temperatures and, and basically stays stable. This couldn't happen to, without the amazing help, which I had from electron microscopy group, workshop engineers, lab assistants, even OU's admins, finance, and managers, head of the school, all of them helped uh, to make this possible within such a short time. We basically went from the TLR3 to the production level within effectively nine months, which was pretty much impressive. Okay, now the second part of my talk uh, goes back to when I used to work in Harry's group. And the development of famous uh, CAM Alloy 4, actually, at least his, the people in this area, they know what CAM Alloy 4 is. Okay, it was Harry's own initiative, an idea that it is possible to make a welding alloy austenitic, more tensitic, which can reduce the stress. And based on his idea and uh, funding, which came, I think, from Ministry of Defense, I designed CAM alloys one, two, three, and four. Actually, when I say I designed, I had very, very key help from uh, former PT group member, Matthew Pitt. He helped me a lot. CAM alloy one or two never existed. It was theoretical. CAM alloy three was made only 500 grams. Uh, we cast in the process lab. And uh, I remember just, I added very little nickel to that, to the same cost, and it turned out to become alloy four. So that's quite unusual that just with one or two trial, experimental trial, we got the condition right. The alloy was fully developed, tested. I will show you the tests. And later on, I heard that it was branded by ESOP as a Cordwell LTTM. The work, the project was a very large project. The leading uh, supervisor was Harry. I did the design, lots of lots of experiments uh, done by my friend Richard Moet and Phil Withers in University of Manchester. ESOP made large components and large amount of the welding cam alloy for, for testing, etc. Okay, now back to a bit less technical bit for the audience, which may not be expert in the field. And anything which is cooling mm, tends to shrink, almost everything. And if it is constrained, basically it's not allowed to shrink free, freely, it will build up a stress. That's what's happening in CAM alloy four, which is basically steel, is a kind of stainless steel. So the, you see that the stress is building up and as the stress goes up and uh, at just before 200 degrees C, it suddenly, it goes through a kind of transformation and in a simple language, it expands or it goes through some dilation. So effectively the residual stress, tensile residual stress turns back, turns goes to zero and then turns back even to compressive stress. It, it, this, is, this is unusual, but it happens during the certain transformation and still is a Martin's austenitic to Martin's transformation. And, um, as you see here, this is the component. This is the first sample which was bonded using the CAM alloy four, little bit of that 500 grams, which I mentioned. And I have a, I have a good memory about that one because 
when our technician in the workshop welded the sample and I called Harry, I said, Harry, technician said it's a normal welding, but for some reason, um, this bar, it didn't get distorted. It normally gets distorted. It basically it becomes a bit like a V shape. And that's what I said to Harry on the phone, I think. I, I called his office. And then I remember a few minutes later, Harry came to, to my office and we put this component on the top of a very flat surface. Oh yeah, it, it is, it is dead flat. And that was assuring that we, we got it right anyway. So you can see the neutron uh, XR test. It shows that the um, cam alloy, you can see that dark blue is, is the weldment basically, well deposit by cam alloy for is blue. Blue is good, means compressive stress. And it shows that completely was successful. Okay, again, back again, a little bit technical for our um, steel gurus. Yes, criteria was we shouldn't have carbon like any other welding of stainless steel. Um, maintain low marginal transformation temperature because you, you don't want it to happen too early because the stress starts to build up. And it has to be fully austenitic because you maximize the use of artensite. And the fourth condition, uh, ferritic solidification. This is something I think we got away with it luckily because if we didn't really design for it, but it satisfies that condition. Evaluation of chem cam alloy for a large amount of work, you know, all sorts of microstructure composition, all, lots of hardness tests, tensile tests, comparative distortion tests, subtle test is the one, the graph I showed you, shows the buildup of stress, synchrotron test, a neutron diffraction test with my colleague Richard Moy, formerly from Manchester, now at the Open University. So it was a very big project. Okay, and here we are. I mean, uh, when they say that the proof of the pudding is when it is eaten, uh, you know, they say the proof of the thing is in the eating, but I think it should say when it is eaten by others and not the cook. And that is what I like. I think. The proof that CAM alloy 4 worked was tested by ESOP and they made larger quantity. They did fatigue tests, as you see, one and a half million times more cycle to failure compared to commercial alloy. Uh, I, I tried to continue on CAM alloy 4 after leaving Cambridge and just before COVID, I got funding to decided to from Open University and Santander International Ground to work on CAM Alloy, uh, next generation, I call it Open Alloy One. And the project was with Tsinghua University and Wuhan University of Science Technology. Here you can see the, the welded sample with Open Alloy One. I will explain what Open Alloy is. And Ba Hua Chang, he also was uh, at Harry's group. He was a visiting scientist at Harry's group. And I went there to do some testing on the sample. Unfortunately, the project is pending because of the COVID. Yeah, this is what Open Alloy is, was hoping or is hoping to be is the next generation of CAM alloy. And what it does, you can see the red line, um, which is the new alloy, although you call it CAM alloy 5 or Open Alloy 1. It transforms a little bit later at the lower temperatures, and that makes all the difference because it ends up in near zero residual stress. Okay, potential application of stress reducing uh, uh, weld hours. I think after so many years and what I read and what I heard from industry, okay, it can be used for high precision weldment with minimal distortion. Application is not in car, maybe aerospace, repair and restoration. Then the component which are sensitive to stress corrosion cracking. I think that was the main reason that the project started because cam alloy is also corrosion resistant. That is, that's the key issue because also has got lots of chromium in it. So that, that made the design a little bit more difficult. So it has to basically satisfy all the condition I showed you and also be corrosion resistant in seawater. The third one, large structures when the post heat treatment is not possible. I put question marks here. Why I did that? Because CAM alloy 4 or allo open alloy 1, they have one problem that we hardly mention in the problems that they are expensive. 
I mean, look at the amount of chromium and nickel and even moly add to it, makes it more and more, you know, justifiable for make for that kind of large or heavy applications. That's why I leave it with a with some kind of a, a question mark. Okay, closing remarks and memorable moments with Harry and his team. Okay, where to start? Okay, human brain is got uh, read-only memory and rewritable memory. Read-only memory is my accent. You see, I can't change it or language or the food I like or the religion which I practice or not practice. Those are normally, not always, they are read-only memories. And uh, rewritable, it comes later. You can see the social behavior. Some football fans are are negotiating physically. And also you can see that the social etiquette, uh, the Japanese children learn to behave. Some sort of religious gathering, a very beautiful crystal growth and Harry's Bainat. So the question is that, what is the connection between these pictures, which looks um, almost nothing, but uh, I think all of them are the results of nucleation. It is all about nucleation within the crystal, within our mind, life, where we live. And if somebody asks me, which one is more important, nucleation, growth, or the material, material can be human subject anyway, I would say nucleation is the most important. Because without nucleation, it doesn't matter how the system has a tendency or potential to grow. No nucleation, you get nothing. So all these social behaviors, our beliefs, what we like, what we don't like, and that beautiful crystal, it just started from a nucleation. So now <laughs> the question is why am I saying this for this particular speech? Because I want to make a claim. I want to make a claim that we all know Harry's contribution to the world of steel. That's too obvious to mention. But I think Harry has another impact, which is maybe even more important, more long lasting, is his, because he acted as a nucleation site in many people's lives. Look at these pictures, look at the list of the speaker on this event. You see, they came to Harry's group as a researcher, as already well-developed professors or students. And then when they went back around the world, they, they, became, they became a guru expert in the field, most of them. And that is how I see it. I, I see Harry as a nucleation side for for the world-class renowned experts and engineers. And that is, I think, his contribution to society, which is really, really remarkable. Okay, some memorable and less serious talks. And you see that the pictures which I collected from all sorts of gatherings we had with uh, Harry's group and didn't have time to, would have to find everybody. But as you can see that uh, we really had a good time, lots of fun always with Harry. And uh, that is, that's what I mean, also people will remember for the rest of their life. Okay, so many thanks to Harry for his high training and supervising standards. I rest my case. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for interesting talk. Professor Shizadi, there thank is you very a... much for promoting me to professorships, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> there, yeah, there has been a question raised in the chat by Ahad Shafi, and he asked you to tell us about what was the initial idea to develop a new alloy such as Chem Alloy 4. So, what kinds of properties and characteristics were you looking for? Uh, okay, the, the idea of having a welding alloy, which basically reduces residual stress, was not new. And so before that, it was ferritic alloys, you know, developed that basically when you weld it, 
then it starts to kind of, I call it in quotation mark, expands or dilate basically to reduce the visual stress. But what was new with the CAM alloy project, and that was completely Harry's, I would call it risky idea, that we can do it with austenitic stainless steel. Harry can correct me if I'm wrong, because before that, nobody attempted austenitic martens before. And the reason, because the project sponsor wants that the alloy not only be stress reducing, but also be corrosion resistant. Okay, thank you. So is there other- Just, any... just one other thing that I remember Harry told me that in the proposal, uh, we put the chances of success 70%, because, Anyway, we couldn't guarantee it will happen, but it, 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 it worked out very well. So, so um, Amir, um, I only disagree with one thing. Okay. You know, we shouldn't worry about the cost of steel. Okay. You have to look at the total cost. I understand. So, you know, if you make a nuclear pressure vessel with built-in residual stresses, that's yeah. a much, much greater cost and the cost of the welding alloy. That's correct, that's correct. I mean, I think it very much depends, of course, not for shipbuilding, but as you said, nuclear power plant, who cares, is a small one. Well, the original reason for this project was uh, submarines, actually. Oh, I didn't want to mention it, Harry. I thought yeah, it was yeah. not <laughs> secret. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I know that, but uh, sorry, I kept, it was my, my I, I told you you shouldn't, but anyway, you're right. But you know, the, the submarine people don't care about the costs. You are absolutely right. Okay. Okay, please. Okay, so there isn't any question, yeah, in the chat. So I will ask you one question about what I, uh, yeah, what I would like to know. So you have shown us like three microstructure where it, the when the welded structure was not right for iron and aluminum. Right. But I wonder, since there are so many intermetallic materials between these two metals, what is the microstructure look like as a successive bonding or welding? Okay, with, with the successive bonding, uh, which I'm afraid I can't disclose it, but what you see, is a, is a very good bonding between that interlayer and the steel with a very, very thin and controllable intermetallic. And the other side, you can see that also similar uh, structure or the intermetallic form with the aluminum. But what you don't see is the reaction between aluminum and the steel. And that is what I call it marriage in hell because we should not let these two elements to meet each other at the joint interface. The moment they meet each other, they will form very, very strong intermetallic, which are very brittle. So that is, that is the whole idea. So the inter interlayer in this case works as a bonding element and also works as a diffusion barrier. Please remember that the component will be reheated to 400 degrees C. Even if it is okay during diffusion bonding, during the welding, subsequent welding, it may develop thick interlayer, thick, sorry, thick in, in intermetallics. That's kind of very interesting because you actually want these two to bond, but you don't want the marriage, right? That's right. We don't, we don't want, uh, okay. basically, we don't want to diffuse into through the interlayer. Because so what is the very, normal? Very strong formers, intermetallic formers. So what is the normal time for the diffusion bonding? Normal. In the normal time for the diffusion bonding? Okay, good so, question. Uh, as I mentioned, is I mean, I, the shortest bonding which I have ever done, like 15 minutes, the longest right. one are a few hours. Okay. But for the steel to steel, you normally get away within, within 40 to one hour, 40 minutes to one hour, you can get away. At the right right condition, yes. So it, it, the diffusion bonding is all about just finding the right interlayer temperature and the time to get the recipe right. Yes, but in this particular case, it was not just only bonding and having a st enough a strong, basically joint, but also the joint should survive reheating, and that was a that's a really big challenge. Yeah. Yeah, there is one question in the chat. Do we not have to worry about the stresses due to the difference in thermal expansion 
in the dissimilar welds of aluminum steel. That's right. Yes, yes, we do. Uh, because uh, th that problem is still there. And that is why we need a super strong bond which can survive such a stress. I have done uh, residual stress measurement and yes, there is a stress in it, but because the bond is, you remember that I dip this component into liquid nitrogen and that gives a huge shock. So all the components should survive dipping into liquid nitrogen. And that can only happen with, if you have a near perfect joint, basically 100%. And in that scenario, yes, aluminum can go through a little bit plastic deformation, but not the bond wouldn't come up. And uh, one reason you dip it and then heat it, dip it and heat it in basically liquid nitrogen to make sure that bond is strong enough. And also remember that the, the component is machine. Lots of the material is removed. Some channels are cut inside, some holes, horizontal, vertical. All those material removal helps with reducing residual stress because the more material removed, the less stress builds up at the joint. That is the only benefit of removing the material. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Do you think, is there any other, you know, application for the materials joining that this diffusion bonding can be used better than other types of welding? Yeah, yes, I mean, the, the, the project which I have worked on them is was a rotor for a, for a satellite, is a titanium-based. Uh, I made a component for the Formula One racing cars. So, and then um, the, other comp the other parts which I worked, it was sort of the um, aluminum copper uh, heat sinks for the electric cars, transistors, because the electric cars, they have lots of current, they need a very good cooling system. So actually there are, there are lots of diffusion bond solid state joint in every mobile, every mobile phone, but those are much smaller joints and, uh, and less basically well developed technology. But when it comes to the structural one, much larger one, it becomes a, a bit problematic. I think aluminum steel is one of the most difficult combination of materials to join. And uh, I have also joined aluminum to titanium and some other combination. I have chosen steel because of this event. And also honestly, it, it was the most difficult one because the, the idea of the interlayer what existed before this project, but uh, we have to just upscale it and to make sure it works mu for much larger components. So I can say confidently that we have the technology to join aluminum to steel. And these two, you know, steel is the most important structural material. That, that's no doubt about it. But then after it's steel, it's not titanium, it's aluminum. I mean, aluminum is, is I don't know whether Harry agrees or not. Is it, a, is it second most important structural alloy maybe? So joining these two together has got lots of benefits, lots of applications in aerospace and so on. But so far has always been a difficult you know, field. Maybe that was one of the positive effects of COVID that we worked so hard to achieve it, yeah. Okay, thank Harry, you would and you there- like to comment? Would you like to, to give the second most important structural alloy? I'll, I'll make another comment. You know, yes, the please. reason why, um, uh, at the AstraZeneca vaccine happened so rapidly is because the people already had enormous skills in the area. Yeah. So the reason why you were able to succeed in making these devices in a very short time, given the urgency of the pandemic, is because you have, you are Mr. Bond. Oh, thank okay? you. Yes. <laughs> you thank you can diffusion bond anything to anything. That's very kind of you. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm very grateful for all you've done for us and Amazing time we had in your group.